Okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is Janine Johnson, chairperson for the Clarksville Montgomery County Employee Insurance Trust. Today is June 9th, 2020. This meeting of the Clarksville Montgomery County Employee Insurance Trust is being conducted under Governor Lee's Executive Order Number 16, issued March 20th, 2020. The main purpose of this meeting is to review our COVID-19 benefits, healthcare reform as it applies to COBRA deadline, and to and to hear an ABA therapy appeal plus other business. As a reminder, all voting will be by roll call with a yes or no by each trust member present. Voicing vo votes together or showing of hands is not acceptable. The Zoom video recording of this meeting will be posted on the CMCSS website by Thursday, June 11th, 2020. At this time, I will establish a quorum. When I call your name, please indicate present. Marsha Demarest. Marcia. Present. Thank you. Mark Vanasek. Present. Amanda Beck. Present. Tommy Butler. Present. Charlie Hall. Present. Leslie Helmick. Present. Donna Mahoney. Tim Swa. Present. Jeff Taylor. Here. Kimberly Yarbrough. Present. Kelly Jackson. Present. John Smith. Present. Ed Long. Present. Michael Johnson. Present. I don't believe Kay Rye is here. She had uh, sent me an email. And Mary Thomas. Present. Great, thank you. We do have a quorum. So we will go ahead and move forward. Um, we do have two presentations that we're going to have today before the actual agenda. So we'll go ahead and start with, um, <coughs> Tom is, is here, so we'll go ahead. He's got his setup, the diabetes overview. This is the True Life Care presentation with Tom Milan. And Tom, if you wanna go ahead and get started, that would be great. Okay, well, thank you, Janine, and uh, also Tim and all the folks at the county. It's a pleasure to be here for a few minutes to tell you about the True Life Care program. We'll soon celebrate our fifth anniversary uh, with your uh, health plan with the trust, uh, and it, which is a, it's a great privilege for us to work with your people on a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is diabetes. Uh, I've, I've had, had some personal experiences with dear friends. It's been 17 years now. I was a CFO, COO type, but uh, became interested in diabetes and uh, with my clinical mentor, Dr. Larry Wolf, uh, Nashville's first full-time endocrinologist, in fact. Uh, I've, I've come a long way in those 17 years and we're really proud of our program and what we can do to help people to help themselves. And as you have no doubt heard, there's when it comes to healthcare and health plans in general, employer health plans, there's not much you can modify in terms of the certain factors, you know, age, uh, gender, genetics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to diabetes, uh, there are things that people living with diabetes can do that do favorably modify uh, their risk factors. But it's hard to do it alone. And it, much like, frankly, much like school, uh, much like a, a sports team, uh, when you've got structure, when you've got uh, someone with uh, skills and expertise and knowledge to share and that people can respect and a relationship is developed, uh, more people perform better than otherwise. And, and that's really the underpinnings of the True Life Care program. So as we get started, what I'd like to do, and, and Janine, have you shared my screen? Can you all see the, that says diabetes overview? Okay, yes. Okay, thank you very much, just uh -huh. to confirm. So what I'd like to do is real quickly, is take about four minutes and give you some uh, background on diabetes. Uh, which has been around and, and discussed in uh, our history for over 3,500 years now. It's actually, the Egyptian physicians first wrote about it uh, in 15, about 1550 BC, and through the centuries, the millennia, in fact, uh, it's, it was noted by physicians as being a rare condition uh, and uniformly fatal uh, within just months. What we know today as type one, but that it was uniformly fatal 
And it was in the, I think, second century or so that uh, a Greek physician, Arateus, uh, first named it diabetes, which is from a Greek word, diaminium, or something close to that, uh, and which meant uh, to pass through, like a siphoning off. It was from the uh, excessive uh, urine production. And it was uh, uh, an English physician in the 1400s who added the Latin word melitus, which is sweet, uh, which is describes the taste of the urine. And for centuries, up until 1921, in fact, that is how diabetes uh, was firmly diagnosed, was through a, a taste of urine, uh, which I know uh, our clinicians are glad that's not the case today. But it was in 1921 that it all changed with the discovery of insulin and then the work to purify it so it could be given by human injection. And on January 11, 22, this young lad right here, uh, that's Leonard Thompson, uh, it's hard to believe that just a few years later, he was, it's 14 years old in his mother's arms, weighing 65 pounds at the time. He was barely alive, slipping in and out of a coma, and uh, he, he became uh, the world's first person uh, to receive insulin, which the doctor said, the researcher said, look, this is a treatment, not a cure, but he did develop into a fine looking young man once uh, his body got what was needed. But as you see in this lower right corner, and just 13 years later, at age 27, he died of pneumonia, which his physicians described as a complication of his diabetes condition. And it was those five years from basically 1935 to 1940 when a host of complications appeared. Suddenly these young people who only lived a few months were living 10 and even now uh, almost 20 years and they had they were developing the complications we know uh, they were the first ones uh, with their the losing their eyesight, uh, kidneys failing, uh, sores on their feet that, that turned into abscesses and gangrene and amputations. Uh, that was what and, and nobody knew what to do. Holy cow what that was the ongoing years of hyperglycemia. Uh, and so now we get into the 40s and the 50s still with nothing other than insulin to deal with. Uh, but we had America, uh, people living, having a longer lifespan, enjoying a longer lifespan. We had the, the dietary and activity changes we all learned about and read about uh, over those decades. And uh, another type of diabetes was becoming more common in presenting itself in medicine. It, it originally was written about in about the five and six hundreds as a disease that afflicted the wealthy who were overfed, <laughs> in fact. Uh, but uh, that's not the case today. And, and so in 1959, medicine categorized two types of diabetes, one and two. One being your pancreas makes zero insulin. You, you have to have it to stay alive. Uh, and the other being type two, which is insulin resistance, body not using insulin properly. Uh, Etc. And whereas there were 100,000 people uh, a year diagnosed in the 50s, let's say, uh, that began progressing. And there were no tools other than insulin until the 70s when hospitals actually had the first glucometer where they could do a quick test. It was taking a blood draw or a urine sample. And the urine sample is really way late. That's after your body is trying to get rid of the uh, excess glucose. But uh, now we're up to two or 300,000 a year being diagnosed. And then the 80s, uh, the A1C test was developed of the home use glucometer, the home use meter came into being. So now there was a way to clinically measure for the very first time. And so studies were starting to be conducted. And then we get to the 1990s and believe it or not, we're up to closing in on a million people a year being diagnosed, 95% with type two and 80% being over the age of 65 at that point in time is, is uh, the, uh, sort of the, the older generation, the greatest generation was starting to develop their diabetes at, in a, at late ages. And the, the science-based results, the uh, diabetes con uh, complications and control trial that was for type one showed clearly that uh, you know maintaining uh, an A1C closer to seven, whereas it had been closer to nine, hugely impacted in a positive way a person's health and outcomes and hospitalizations. Uh, the United Kingdom conducted a prospective diabetes study for type two, 
it showed less of an improvement, but still a clear and marked improvement when there is better uh, control. And so that then led to an explosion, uh, it coincided with, I should say, an explosion of diagnoses. We actually reached 1.9 million newly diagnosed one year. It's today about 1.5 million every year being newly diagnosed and tons of research, just tons, which has led to pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, investing and uh, putting out all kinds of medications. There's a very safe one that everybody has been around for uh, 30 years. Metformin uh, came into the U.S. in, in the 90s. Uh, it's pennies a pill. It's almost free. And uh, it really helps the pancreas to produce more insulin. And then, but then now there are all these that you see advertised on TV, Genuvia, Invocano, Zempic, oh, 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 Zempic, something like that, or Trulicity things. You know, Ozempic and Trulicity are $10,000 a year. Uh, Genuvia, Invocana, Parziga, et cetera, are five and a half, six thousand dollars $6,000 a year. And there are no studies that show that, hey, take this pill or take this injection and it takes care of you. Uh, all the studies show that you've got to actively work on your lifestyle, your behavior, but they really don't have much impact, uh, which you'll, you'll see an example of that in just a minute. And that's where True Life Care uh, steps in and, and partners with our clients, partners with you. Um, we give, uh, we, we are able to, you know, thanks to you and, and what you do with us, we're able to provide all the supplies that a person needs to check their glucose. And they don't have any copay, coinsurance, or deductible to deal with. So that takes some financial burden off to start a conversation. And they appreciate that because with diabetes, a person has many hundreds of dollars more per year out of pocket than the person without diabetes. It's a big deal. So with True Life Care, they've got a choice of glucometers. There's no charge. There's no charge to your plan either. Uh, there's also a blood pressure meter and cuff. Uh, if they're hypertensive, which most are, and if they don't have one already, we want them involved and engaged with their numbers. There are studies that clearly show the better, if you have diabetes, the better your blood pressure is controlled, the much better your outcomes are. And all of that is Bluetooth capable. Uh, it's, it's, if, if you choose to, it's all personalized. What do you want to do? What are you interested in? Uh, there's a secure app uh, for Android and iOS. It's shareable with your physician right from the app or from a, with a loved one. It's all coordinated through the person's one-to-one uh, -one relationship with their dedicated uh, registered nurse who's a certified health coach. So a nurse with some experience, but who has gone through uh, the coaching curriculum of the National Society of Health Coaches and has passed uh, the two-part certification exam and maintains an active license that's required uh, for all of our coaches. And they have a, a library of materials, printed and electronic, uh, you know, meal planning, cookbooks, recipes, uh, educational tips and aids, even a pedometer, there are other things. They have all to help uh, the person stay engaged so, you know, with their medications, with their provider, you know, we're, we don't do anything clinical. Uh, it, we're successful, as we say, when the, the person is engaged with hitting the targets, the objectives that their clinician, their provider is asking of them. That's what we're uh, eliciting from them in our conversations and then working with them to become engaged with. But now let's shift and, and get specific with uh, uh, the, 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 your insurance trust uh, we're going to report here on July of 18 to June of 2019. That's the program year. We started in July of 2015. Uh, we'll soon, this fall, late fall, we'll report on the most recent year. So in, in between 2018 and 19, there were just over 7% of the total plan uh, trust population living with diabetes, a little over 9%, nine and a half or so of the adults. Uh, those one out of every 13, 14 people uh, consumed one out of three of all the pharmacy dollars uh, that were uh, spent and one out of five of all the medical uh, claim dollars. So, and it's those, the complications you heard about uh, just a moment ago. So what's happening with the diabetes population? We're going to look at over the four year period, you know, it's 700-ish uh, people or so. 650, 700, depending on the year. Uh, but so it's not 100,000, but let's just combine all four years so that you get a good measure of uh, how the people are averaging in terms of uh, their outcomes. And so we're gonna take the four year annual average for 
uh, things as a CFO and logic to me, which are health events, uh, hospitalizations, uh, and how long those hospitalizations are. So we have two groups. We have uh, not in true life care, which is about two thirds. We run 33% participation. It's a voluntary program. Changing your behavior is voluntary, certainly, and, and it's hard work. And, and so, uh, and I've one third in true life care. So we're gonna look at uh, the, the rate of hospitalizations in the populations. And for the ones going in their usual and customary way, some of whom uh, probably do it 100% correct, have a wonderful provider they're really connected with, some are doing what they do, the way they've always done it. Uh, and, and the annual rate has been 16.4%. Compare that to the population with no diabetes, which is five to 6% a year incidence of a hospitalization of all types. Uh, true life care has been lower, almost 20% lower. 16.4, uh, by the way, is the US average, right in the 16 to 17% range. That's from the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and the average length of stay uh, in the uh, not in true life care group has been six days right on the money. Uh, that is also the US average. Uh, having high glucose when you go in the hospital uh, slows down healing, makes it more difficult. And also it's one of the discharge protocols. We've got to have your glucose under control. It can, it, can, it can add another day or so. So, and consistent in our book of business, every client sees this, is that, uh, our, that when an admit does occur, and they still do occur, as you see, uh, there are some areas anywhere from a third to a half as long, or less as long. And when you put a, a, a number to that, uh, in, in the 2018-19 year, across all of your hospitalizations, for those with diabetes, the average cost per day, that's the hospital, doctors, uh, surgeons, imaging, whatever they do, was $9,456 per day. Uh, and, and, and to use, let's say $8,500, just to be lower conservative and allow for inflation across these four years, uh, that group of TLC members represents a $2.8 million lower spend uh, over the, across the four years from the fewer admits in shorter days. And one other quick example, that's a, a cohort within the overall group uh, in the, uh, within the overall group, there are 118, as you see here in the right corner, uh, people that have been using insulin across all four years. So we're going to exclude any new hires or um, terminations during the period. They've been there all four years. And we're going to look at their annual claims that were reimbursed uh, medically, uh, which is what can be influenced. And again, the same, not in true life care, the usual and customary way versus true life care members. Uh, in that base year, when, when uh, the first year of the program, uh, the average was $12,500 against those in true life care, 14,256. So the current period, most so three years later, fast forward, what happens? Diabetes progresses, uh, it doesn't regress uh, absent uh, personal uh, dedicated continuous action, which is difficult, as we said, but uh, the cost in the 72, I think it is, uh, has doubled to $25,000 per year, whereas in the uh, TLC members working with their coach, trying, you know, doing their best to uh, to maintain their health in the, in, the, in the best way possible, and it doesn't always go perfect, uh, it's been an increase, but there's been inflation too, so 16000 and that uh, is all represented by fewer hospitalization and shorter lengths of stay. Uh, and just to give you an idea, if those 46 people, I think, had spent at that higher level, they would have spent $415,000 more in, in this one year of 2018-19. So it shows you the power, uh, much like uh, education and good coaching can do in a, in a group of people. Uh, you, you elicit more of them to, to do better and you don't get everybody involved, but uh, but you have you, you you raise up the overall averages. So uh, it's a, again, it's a privilege for us to be here. It's a privilege for us to, to work with people with diabetes. We we have a passion for it. These are quotes I'll just put up. You can read, scan over. They're quotes our coaches shared with me who work with your uh, employees or, or covered spouses. Uh, specific comments 
uh, during May that were made to them. Uh, you know, we, we're blessed that, you know, basically we are a remote program. We had to jump through a few hoops to be sure our coaches could securely and properly work remotely, but uh, we haven't missed a beat. And uh, again, Janine, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions or if, if you direct your questions to Janine, she can direct them to me for follow up. Janine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, Tom. Um, I, I think some of you have seen the previous uh, presentations that we've done. So as a reminder, this is something that we do offer in addition to our medical plan and um, True Life reaches out to our employees, our family members, and um, it's an optional program, but once they do join, they do receive a lot of extra supports, and we hope that that extra support will um, help keep our kids down, basically, and it appears right. to be working. Yeah, so does anybody have any questions? This is generally something we like to look at on a yearly basis, so. I'm not, and if it, and I don't have right now. My screen is small, so if you do have a question, just yell out. I'm, I'm not seeing everyone. And and uh, and there was a more a more detailed report, I think, uh, that you're providing to everyone. So yes, so these were these were the highlights. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was sent out by Donna. Mm -hmm. do, do I hear a question? Maybe just some feedback. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate so I'll, it, Tom. I'll sign off again. Thank you, okay. everyone. Continue to stay safe and well, and uh, I sure look forward to school being back in session. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there we go. All right. And I think I just saw Christine Johns Johnston, I was going to say Johnson, Johnston with Epiphany there. I see her, her smiling face. So we, we will, as a reminder, Epiphany, is the um, third party uh, provider for our pharmaceutical plan. So she's got some really great information. A few, feels like it was, it was more than a few months ago. They did host um, Tommy, myself, and a few, I think Donna and Amy, and maybe Sharla. And uh, we went down to their um, location in Nashville and they hosted us for a review of our data. And it was, it was a really great meeting. So um we are ready to looks like every hopefully everybody can see that screen so i will let christine go ahead and take over thank you thank you janine hey janine can i say something real quick yes go ahead chris uh, i'm not sure how many of the trust members have met christine she uh she's the new account manager and she's been a pleasure to work with i know we've all enjoyed working with christine she's got a lot of experience in this pbm space and uh Really look forward to her presenting to you all today. Good results, and just want to, uh, you know, thank the uh, Epiphany team and Christine for the for the good job. So, I just didn't know how many people actually had met Christine, and uh, it won't be long before she'll be able to be with everybody face to face. But uh, anyway, thanks, Christine. Take it away. Yeah, I was missed seeing you all earlier this year. I was actually in, on my way to the. Clarksville trustee meeting last time that you guys had to cancel it and but I'll so hopefully soon enough we'll meet in person but I'm really excited to present the results today and um, you know I just really want to mention that you know Janine and, and uh, Tommy and Sharla and Chris of course are great partners and we've been able to do some really creative things um, with your pharmacy benefit the past year and so as you all no, we, we implemented Clarksville in January 2019. I became involved in the account um, in September when I joined the Epiphany team. And ever since then, we've been able to do some really creative things to help you all manage your overall pharmacy costs. And so some of the things that we're gonna talk about today is, is not just managing it on the pharmacy side. We've been moving some of the drugs um, over from the medical benefit over to the pharmacy benefit and been able to reap a lot of savings to the plan, but also um, add convenience for the members, which is really valuable too. So I just wanted to touch on some highlights here. Um, this is our dashboard report that we do review with, with the, the staff every quarter. Um, just wanted to call a lot of numbers here. I just wanted to call out some highlights here, but the first quarter 2019 um, cost, plan cost per member per month ran at, at $103.81. And it, you know, based on what we know, that's down significantly from where you were previously. When we look at 2020, the first quarter there, we did have a $1.92 increase, but very minimal 
increase in the cost per member per month, and we're up to $105.73. Now, keep in mind, this increase is slight, but we have taken on management of some very high-cost um, patients from your medical benefit. And in addition, we've had several new um, high-cost specialty patients, uh, particularly a new hemophilia patient, a couple of cystic fibrosis patients. But because of some of the cost management strategies that we employ, we've been able to save um, you, you all uh, the cost of those. So basically, you've been bringing the cost of those patients on, but the plan hasn't um, inherited the, the cost burden of those members. So one of the big functions of our savings, we have two components. Um, we do a lot of clinical management, making sure that the members are on the right drug at the right dosing before we ever approve coverage. And then once we do approve coverage, we do also look at making sure we can take advantage of any monies available from manufacturers. And that is a big part of that is our copay assistance program. And also we take advantage of any rebate dollars available. One of the big things that Clark still implemented um, late last year was our diabetes copay assistance program. So this does take advantage of the True Life program where we, we are um, helping manage the costs related to those diabetes patients. But if you look at toward the very bottom here, we have 80, about $86,000 of savings just in first quarter by taking advantage of the uh, copay assistance program for those diabetes medications. And so that's been a, you know, we're, we're making sure the members are on the right drugs in the first place, but then when they are prescribed those medications, we wanna make sure we can um, financially benefit. And I know the clinic, um, Sharla, particularly we've given Sharla um, a handout about this program. And so she's educate, helping us educate members about that. So it's not disruptive to them. But, um, you know, overall we've saved the plan in the, our copay assistance program just in first quarter, about $700,000. And that's just, um, taking advantage of the programs that, that manufacturers are already making available and maximize any savings we can from, from them. A lot of numbers here, but any, any questions at a high level on this? Okay, so on the next slide here, I just wanna talk about some of the program savings. So we look at um, savings for your plan in three areas, the clinical program savings, which is primarily our prior authorization activity. Um, so our clinicians receive requests for medications and we review those to make sure they're appropriate. And in the case where we either deny it or we recommend a change in therapy, we capture that savings as a, just the one, one time we avoided the cost. So in first quarter, we were able to help um, the plan save about $160,000 in our prior authorization activity. And then, as I mentioned before, our copay assistance program has uh, saved the plan about $700,000 just in first quarter. We do have typically have more savings in first and second quarter than the latter part of the year because the way the program works, there's, a, there's a, a, a certain amount the manufacturers make available per member uh, per year. And what we try to do is maximize it up front. And so um, we do typically see a significant savings in first quarter, but because of the implementation of the diabetes copay assistance program, we've been able to increase that for the plan. We do not yet have the first quarter rebate estimates. So those should be available next week. And I do re re um, provide the staff a detailed report on a per drug basis once we receive that. So when we take out our fees, um, we're looking at a net program savings just in one quarter of about $690,000. So you all are really, um, you know, ahead of the game, I think, when it comes to taking advantage of any opportunities that we present. Anytime I call up Tommy and say, hey, what do you think about this idea? He's like, yep, if it will save the plan money and not disrupt the members, let's do it. So um, we've been able to be really aggressive with any cost savings opportunities available. When we go to the next slide, this is a case that um, I know Charlotte particularly has been working very hard on this case, but Sandostatin. It's a, it's a drug that was previously um, managed under the medical benefit. Um, but what we have decided to do is just look at any opportunity we can take advantage of and utilize the clinic, the onsite clinic you all have available. That clinic is a very great resource for your employees and the members. And so we were having conversations with the clinic to see what we, could we do to help manage the cost. So we, ha we had the Sandostatin patient. It's a, it's a 56 year old male. He was traveling to Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt on a monthly basis to receive his medication. It was taking him about four hours um, to drive round trips just for that 10 minute administration. 
So we looked at what could we do to help um, manage the cost for the plan, but also increase the quality of his life because this is very intrusive to his life, to his lifestyle. So we moved him over to the clinic. Um, there's a nurse there that administers this medication. We, um, since September of 2019, he has received seven administrations and we've saved the plan about $60,000 in the combination of the cost, the reduction in the cost of the drug, and also taking advantage of some copay assistance that's available. Now, I think, Sharla, I don't know if you want to talk about this case, but I know that this particular patient has said that this has given his life back to him. Any yes, he, he, um, he made the comment, actually his wife even made the comment and said that uh, he, right before we made these switches, she was, um, she felt like he had given up and he wasn't going to get his treatment anymore, which would, of course, result into some horrible things, uh, potential, potentially death. But once he started getting it at the clinic, that now he is happy and he's fine and he's started back on the meds and, you know, thrilled. So I'm glad to have made an impact in their life. We've identified since this um, two additional patients that are on this medication. And so we're working really closely with Charlotte to see if there's an opportunity to move those also over to the clinic. Now this next case, I'm particularly excited about sharing with you all. Um, this is a case we've been working with you all since we, we um, became engaged. And this is a um, patient on Fabrizyme. Um, this patient has Fabry's disease. It's a very rare condition. Um, this patient is going every week to Vanderbilt Medical Center to receive her infusion. Um, it's costing the plan about $1.8 million a year for her infusion. Um, not only that, she's having to travel two hours, on, and she was going um, public transportation to the hospital. Um, and so it's very inconvenient. And also with her condition, we were concerned about um, having her on a bus. So, what we started doing is we had a conversation with Dixie Vital Care to see if, if we could move the infusion to them. Um, the doctor um, was concerned because of her um, condition. It wasn't stable, and so she really wanted the, the patient to continue to go to, the, to Vanderbilt to receive her in, um, infusion. Um, this is a case where COVID has helped us <laughs> um, because, because of that, um, the doctor did not want her going um, all the way to Vanderbilt. So we received, we, we were finally able to convince the doctor to move to Dixie Vital Care. We've reduced the infusion cost from $35,000 per infusion to about $19,000 per infusion. When we extrapolate that across the entire year, just this one patient, we're estimating we're going to save about $850,000. And we have um, confirmed that she's received three infusions now through Dixie Vital Care, and everything's going very well. We've been checking in very closely with the doctor and um, Dixie. So great story here. We're really excited about this case. So we continue to look for any opportunities we can. So a couple things that I wanted to talk about is potential opportunities I wanted to bring to you all for consideration is um, a non-essential non um, health benefit strategy and also um, looking at, um, at expanding of the copay assistance program. So um, the Affordable Care Act um, requires that, that you all as a plan sponsor cover a certain number of drugs within each therapeutic class, but you don't have to cover all drugs and they don't even define what specific drugs you have to cover. So what we've done is we've taken this benchmark, as they call it in the state, and determined what drugs do we need to cover under what's called your essential benefit. And those drugs need to count towards your out-of-pocket amounts, and those drugs need to be, um, have the benefit defined as you guys have it defined in your, uh, your SPD. But we have this other group of drugs that we can call non-essential health benefits. And so what we're able to do with that non-essential health benefits is we're able to apply a different coinsurance to those medications, and we're also able to not count those medications towards your out-of-pocket, so your medical out-of-pocket or your pharmacy out-of-pocket. So it allows us to um, take advantage of, of collecting ma money from manufacturers. So once your members have met their out-of-pocket maximum, we're not able to continue to collect um, coinsurance from, um, from the manufacturers or copay assistance from those manufacturers. And also, um, they're not willing to pay as much if they feel that you have a generous benefit. 
So what we've come up with is a benefit where basically we say these non-essential drugs, and currently we have about 20 drugs on this drug list that we've determined are clinically necessary, but frankly, the drug manufacturers have priced them way too high. And so what we're trying to do is re-engineer your benefit so we can collect more money from the manufacturers. And so for you all, we've taken a look at the drugs that are on our list that we know we can go get more money from manufacturers if we were to implement a program like this. And we have two patients on Trikafta. Trikafta is a cystic fibrosis medication. Very effective medication. It's actually, we, it was recently released last year and it's actually very effective. And so our recommendation would be to implement this program and we would be able to get additional savings for you all because the manufacturer we will know we know will cover up to 50% of the cost um, for these patients. And so when we look at the savings plus take into account, um, you know, uh, the amount the member would pay, um, they would not pay anything for this medication, and it would save the plan about $103,000 um, just on these claims. So it's not this is not an annualized amount. This is if we would have had that plan the plan in place for the claims that the members have already incurred in 2020. So if it's something that you all are interested in, it would take a modification to your SPD. We do need to add language to include, um, it's essentially a paragraph that it outlines a non-essential health benefit. The drug manufacturers ask when we implement this program to prove that this is part of your benefit. And so we do in our negotiations with the drug manufacturers, um, have to provide them a copy of your SPD. So it would be technically a plan design change, but it, we, it would not be a negative member impact. Christine, can I say something here? Sure. Yeah, the $32,000 savings right there. Again, I guess this is an example of uh, plan design and providers, I guess maximizing their reimbursement from plan design because if the plan des design is, is amended per your recommendation, then of course the providers are fine with it and it saves the plan money. Is that yeah. right in a nutshell, kind of? Kind of, yeah. And so what we've done is we've identified drugs that are they're new drugs. Um, you know, there's that million dollar treatment, Bilgimza, for example, is on this drug list that we think are really actually good drugs, but the manufacturers just have flat out priced them too high for a plan sponsor to afford. And so what we're trying to do is say, okay, plan sponsor, or hey, okay, manufacturer, we'll recommend that coverage for this, but you need to pony up a little bit more. And they are willing to do that if your plan design supports it. And that's the key, making sure, sure the plan design supports it. So that's what it requires. It just requires to, to, to obtain these savings, we just have to make a plan amendment. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we will work with the member to make sure they do not incur um, more costs than they would under your plan design. That's the key too. So that's one recommendation we have. Um, the next recommendation we have is we've had great success with your diabetes copay assistance program. What we've decided is to take a look at other high cost brand dr drugs. Um, to see if there's copay assistance available on those drugs. So these are drugs like Eliquis, Seralto, which are anticoagulant agents or high cost asthma medications, for example. Um, we are um, able to collect copay assistance on those and be able to reduce the members out of pocket, but at the same time help um, the plan save. So we've identified when we looked at the past year of data for you all, we've identified about 1,800 members. So it is a large number of members that would be impacted by this, but we estimate the annual savings would be about $573,000 if we were to implement this program. We would be able to implement this program mid-year. So we could roll this out um, on um, August or September 1st, if you like, if you all would like. Your current SBD does support um, the implementation or the expansion of the copay assistance program, so it wouldn't require a plan design change. But we would want to notify these members because they do need to enroll in the copay assistance program to continue to get their medications so we can have the plan benefit from the savings. So that's the other reason I'm bringing this to the trustees so you all can consider it, see if it's something you want to move forward with. And obviously, we would provide Charla um, at the clinic the list of the medications that would be impacted so she could, you know, help talk to these members also because she's been very helpful with that. 
So Chris saying it does not impact the member financially, but it just requires a little, uh, I guess, uh, effort on their part to actually enroll in the program. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they do all have to enroll in the manufacturer program. Most of it is just going online and um, filling out the form and then calling the pharmacy to get um, to give that pharmacy the, the information that they need once they've completed the enrollment. Um, but yeah, it won't negatively impact the, the members financially. And it'll save the plan potentially $573,000. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those are the two things that I wanted to present for you all to consider in addition to um, presenting the positive results that we've had for first quarter. So I don't know, um, Janine, what, it, what would you view as the next step? Yeah, um, generally something like that, what I would suggest would be that um, I usually like to we want to have ability for more conversation and questions. Sure. A plan change. So I'm wondering if this could be something as you had suggested, um, providing a paragraph on how the plan document would be changed. And maybe some, you know, we could have a list of different, uh, the other one, the different medications that um, we would be requiring them to have the manufacturer assistance. Those would be two things that I think would be good to share with the trust members. And then at the next meeting, I'd like to have this up where it could be an item that we could vote on. Okay. Tommy, do you have any other suggestions? Uh, Chris, were any of these time sensitive? Like I couldn't remember with, in regards to plan year or anything, were either one of them uh, time sensitive? Did you ask me, Tommy, or Christine? Yeah, I'm asking you, Chris. I couldn't remember when we first talked about these at the report if there was a time sensitivity issue to either one of them. Well, I think we can defer to Christine on that as far as timing and lead time and so forth. But you know, our recommendation, I think, follows uh, probably right along with yours, uh, Tommy, is anything we can do to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, if I understood what Christine was was um, what she had indicated earlier, there were a couple medications that were in one of the programs that uh, members had now. And if we can implement the program before any other member has that medication, then of course that would be a plus. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the main thing is maybe if Christine would get us a plan of action together so we could distribute it to the, the trust members so they could make a, uh, an educated decision evaluation on whether to implement those as soon as possible. Yes, yeah, so the, um, just to give you a perspective that to implement the traditional copay assistance program, we would like, given the number of members, we would like to have um, a 45 day notice so we can make sure, because what we do with that, it was going to do a multi-pronged communication strategy. We'll send out the letters to the members. We then follow up with a phone call. We also follow it up with a, an email if we have access to the email addresses. We would also want to give the list of Charlotte in case she happens to see any of those members in the clinic. That's always a great um, process also. So 45 days ideally to make sure we don't have any disruption at the point of sale for these members. The non-EHB benefit, because it does require an update to the SBD, we would need to do a 60 day notification because it would be a material change to the SBD. So that would take 60 days where we need to update the document. and. Um, as Chris was saying, um, currently you all only have one, uh, two members on one of these drugs. We, what we wanted to do is really get the strategy out there as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, these drugs um, are being released to the market quite often, these high cost drugs, and we want to get ahead of it so we can make sure um, you all can um, not incur the burden of the cost of these medications as much. I think if we could place yeah. those those items on the agenda for our next meeting, because I know we do have another uh, appeal thing that, so I'm looking at, we're probably going to need to have a meeting sometime in July based on an item that just came in yesterday to the benefits office, so. Okay. Well, I'll get you the summary out um, today so you can have okay. access to that. Do any of the other members have any questions for Christine? And okay. thank you again. Um, as you can see, they, when we went to the, the annual review, it was amazing the detail information they have on 
our members and the amount of customer service support they provide them. And I know that Amy and Donna always sing their praises because they're very responsive. And I think the word that we always heard Chris use when we started looking at um, different vendors for pharmacy was nimble, that they're very quick and they respond very quickly. And we appreciate that because that definitely does save the plan money. So thank you um, for taking the time. And then we'll, um, at the end of, we'll, we'll schedule a meeting and then at our next meeting, which I think will be sometime in July, we'll definitely plan on having that on the agenda for the members to vote on. Okay, sounds good, thank you. All right, thank you. Take care, bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so we'll move on to, um, move right along here. I'm gonna, um, let's see, our next item is review of April 27 meeting minutes. Uh, Donna sent those out to everyone. Does anybody have any corrections, questions, additions? If not, um, I'll entertain a motion. This is Mark. I move to accept. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Who? I'm sorry. Who was it? Kimberly Yarbrough. Okay. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and do a roll call. So we'll go ahead. We have a first and a second for the approval of the April 27th minute. Did, did someone have a question? I think it might just be feedback. Okay. Um, if you could, as I as I do a roll call, you could say yes or no. Marcia Demarest? Yes. Mark Banasek? Yes. Amanda Beck? Tommy Butler? Yes. Charlie Hall? Yes. Leslie Helmick? Yes. Donna Mahoney? Yes. Tim Swab? Yes. Jeff Taylor? Yes. Kimberly Yarbrough? Yes. Kelly Jackson? Yes. Don Smith? Yes. Ed Long? Yes. Michael Johnson? Yes. I don't think Kay has joined us. I'm not seeing her name. Okay. And Mary Thomas? Yes. Okay, great. All in favor then? We'll move on. Uh, next item, uh, Tommy, we're going to be able to get you in before you have to head to your next meeting. Uh, under old business, on-site update? Oh, I don't have a lot of update. I think Charla has a few things, but I will say that we we met with county maintenance and um, some of the school systems maintenance today over at the clinic to start thinking about here in the next few weeks of connecting the two spaces, even though we're not at this time moving forward with the project. Um, the, the veterans group will be out of there at the end of this month. So we'll go ahead and connect them and start using that space that we, we greatly need and then hopefully revisit the um, bid project within the next month or two. And if you are not speaking, if I could have you hit your mute, we're getting some feedback. I could have you mute your microphone. Thank you. Okay, Sharla, did you have anything? Sure, um, in May, looking at our numbers, we saw exactly half of the patients that we saw last May, so May of 2019. And so we knew we needed to be a little aggressive and we have started a, a patient campaign where we are trying to make sure our patients are educated that we have started telehealth. So those services will be permanent and we're getting great feedback on the telehealth. And also that we have hired a licensed mental uh, health therapist that will be starting um, probably right after the July 4th weekend. So you may get a phone call or an email or text or something like that about those, service, those services. And we're calling that like our outreach project. Um, we've received wonderful feedback about the telehealth. And so we really want people to know about that because that's gonna be a cost saver for people in those later times or when they're on vacation uh, from going to an expensive place to get services because we're here and we can do it uh, over the phone or uh, with, a, with a click of a link, like a Zoom link. Um, so that's something that we want to go to everyone. Um, we do have two people that are vacating their positions. Uh, one is a medical office assistant that's up front 
Uh, her husband is leaving and we also have a nurse that's uh, leaving us and we, I've chosen not to fill those positions due to the low capacity and, and for cost savings as well. So um, th that's really what's going on with us. We are just preparing to ramp up those services so that we can have more cost savings and also the infusion services, we are still working hard at getting that started. And our goal time for that is July 4th, that weekend. After that, we plan on trying to utilize that other new space and get those services started for additional cost savings. Okay, thank you very much, Sharla. Um, okay, next item, uh, any questions for Tommy or Sharla from the group? Okay. Next item on the agenda is COVID-19 medical plan benefits monitoring. Chris? Okay, did you all want, does everybody have the document uh, or try to, to put it on the screen? Would you like me to try to, would you like me to share it? Well, if you, if you want to, unless everybody has a, a hard copy or- Everyone a, should have a copy. So we'll, we'll just move forward then. Okay. The first thing I want to mention on the exhibit is just a one pager, and of course, at the top it says COVID 19. There's a typo in the second box. The date should be March and April of 19. The box above that is the April, uh, March and April of 20. So, you all probably will recall at the last meeting, um, our task was to obtain some additional. Uh, claims information, claims data regarding the COVID claims. If you go down to the middle of the page, the plan has tempor temporarily been amended to include early prescriptions and 90-day uh, prescriptions, COVID testing with no member cost share, and then of course the virtual visits. The plan is currently opted out for no cost share for COVID treatment. And that's different than the testing, that's, that's for the treatment. If somebody actually uh, has the illness, then any type of plan payment is subject to the current plan, deductible, co-insurance, et cetera. Uh, if you look in the top box up there, let me also mention, mention this, if this is, this is new reporting for Blue Cross, and so the reports are subject to tweaks in the future. Um, and some pretty interesting data right there, as you'll notice, um, the 46,971, if you look at all the little uh, diagnosis codes out there, there's a few there that indicate COVID-19. So most of the plan expense is for non-COVID related illness. As a matter of fact, from what we could determine from the reporting, out of the $46,000, there's only $1,610 that's related to COVID. And then if you look at the testing right below that, the $6,538, of that $6,538, $5,132 was flu testing. So what does that leave? About $1,400 with other type of testing for respiratory illness. So it does not appear that the plan is, is incurring much expense due to the uh, COVID um, pandemic, which really is surprising to me. I don't know if it is to you all, but it's kind of shocking to me. Now, you look down in the, the uh, 2019 box, total cost for $25,000 for respiratory uh, illness and testing for March and April of 19. So your plan cost did pretty much double, which makes sense to me. I don't know about you, but when this thing first hit, if I had a little nasal drip, or uh, I sneezed or whatever, I kind of wondered if I was coming down with something, you know, and so you could see why people would uh, seek treatment and, uh, and so forth for anything that they thought might be COVID related. But saying all that, um, what we think is that, uh, you know, due to the budget uh, disruption, and based on your medical plan provisions, so you all have got a very, very comprehensive uh, medical uh, plan that it was our recommendation that you consider uh, maintaining the standard uh, provisions for COVID-19 treatment. Now, there's not any action required by the trust unless you all elect to uh, amend the plan 
to waive member cost share for COVID-19 treatment. Thank you for that uh, review and summary, Chris. Does anybody have any questions? So just to, to summarize, we currently do cover the, the cost of tests at 100%. We've been very fortunate in this community. We haven't been hit nearly as hard as other counties. And we also know that our health department was offering free testing. So um, I know everyone that I know that was tested went to the health department. They had a, a drive-through testing. So I would guess that our plan did not, it does not appear that our plan saw a lot of people going and paying for testing. But um, so if we wanted to cover everything that was COVID related, we would need to vote to do that. If we don't do a vote, we just keep our plan as it is right now. Folks meet their deductible, then the plan covers at 90%. And then once the out of pocket is met, then the plan covers at 100%. So I think what I'm hearing Chris say is that he, um, there are consultants advices that we keep our plan as it is currently, since we do have a, a, a very good plan and not uh, make any changes to say that we cover all COVID at 100% COVID treatment. Any questions on that? Okay, if I'm not getting any questions, I'm not hearing where anyone wants to make a motion, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. And again, that would be Chris. Uh, this is the ABA therapy appeal plan. I believe we talked about this briefly at the last meeting and we asked um, the Pheasantons to come back with some suggestions. Is that correct? That's right. And um, this is an area uh, that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I work with the special needs at church and there's a number of, uh, of our uh, special friends that are autistic. So um, it's an area that you definitely have a lot of compassion about. And so anyway, uh, a little background there. There's a request to amend the plan uh, for applied behavior analysis, which we'll uh, refer to as ABA, from the current 35 visit limit to, un to unlimited visits. Uh, the medical plan currently has a 35 visit limit per year for outpatient health treatment. Pre Obamacare, most all plans had some type of limits, visit limits or dollar limits. Post Obamacare, most plans are not allowed to put any type of limit uh, for visits. Uh, the trust has made application and has granted an exemption for the Mental Health Parity Act. So currently you all are not subject to uh, the unlimited limitations or visits uh, required for most plans. Uh, but next to the last bullet there is most plan sponsors uh, do um, uh, let's see so what, let's see where are we yeah most plan sponsors uh, use the exemption to you know help mitigate uh, annual cost increases. Okay, so that we did go back to Blue Cross. I think before we weren't sure whether Blue Cross could actually administer ABA with a 35 uh, visit limitation and maintain, I mean, excuse me, Blue Cross confirmed that they are able to administer ABA with a 35 visit limitation and allow the other mental health therapies to maintain the three. So they are able to separate those therapies. Okay, I think I'm back on track now. Um, so we tried to put together some guesstimates here on cost and you know, you can imagine it's kind of, we were told by uh, resources that uh, costs are kind of like autism. They're all over the place. And so what we did is we, uh, we found out what the average cost per hour is $120. Um, there's different, of course, levels of treatment, anywhere from 40 hours a week down. Um, and so what we did right there with the, the annual cost range for medical plans, if the plan is changed to unlimited uh, visits, we tried to give you a high range, a mid range and a low range. 
And please note that it, that is per occurrence. So if you had some a therapist that wanted to, you know, have somebody in therapy 40 hours a week for an entire year uh, with a plan payment at 50 percent, that would cost about 120. Plan would pay about 120 thousand, and then you can see the mid and the low range. So uh, the current plan exposure is based on an average cost of 120 dollars an hour and a per visit charge. And that's another area that's a little bit complex to uh, determine because uh, treatment could be an hour, it could be four hours, it could be eight hours. It just depends on what the therapist considers that visit. Uh, it's not like, a, you know, typically a, a therapeutic session, maybe for physical therapy, something lasts about an hour or so, you know, but uh, it depends on how the therapist uh, actually decides to, to treat that uh, visitation. So you can see the, the low range and the high range there is what the current exposure to the plan is. Again, we refer to the medical plan maximum cost exposure to members of being 1350 for the per plan and 5250 for the standard plan. So again, um, there's, there's real good protection for the plan member. So again, you know, we kind of look at this, um, the plan design and the budget disruption and so forth. And, you know, we, again, we think consideration should be given to maintaining the current plan provisions. And then we've got several check marks right there. And, and that's, that's kind of the rationale behind how we arrive at that, uh, that uh, decision there. And, um, you know, that as you all know, it seems to become more frequent that there's requests made for plan exceptions and plan amendments to expand the medical plan coverage. Um, you know, we've got the compassion for, you know, our peers and friends and coworkers, um, but it's difficult to, to blend that compassion with the financial responsibility. Uh, and we've uh, provided some support documentation and then there are grants and scholarships. Uh, and assistance that's available. You might want to just flip to page three right there and you can see uh, a number of programs that can help uh, people with these conditions and uh, assist with the uh, financial obligations. And then again, I guess the last point is uh, actions only required if you uh, elect to amend the plan to provide the unlimited ABA visits versus the current 35 plan limitation. Chris, would there be an option if the members chose to increase the 35 to, to 40, but keep all the others to 35? If you were to say, instead of unlimited, modify the number of visits for ABA? Kim, I don't remember on that one. I don't know if that's an option. Do you know if that's an option? Kim, you're, Kim, you're muted. There we go, sorry. Uh, we didn't ask that specific question. I think, Chris, all we asked about was the, uh, the unlimited. I, we don't, I don't know about the 40 without asking. You know, we can go back and revisit that. The one thing that we're not sure of, if you do make any type of change here, whether it's a, you know, if Blue Cross could administer a 40 day limit, if you make a change there, we're not sure. And we really don't want to go to HHS and ask, but you might lose your total exemption uh, just simply because you're, you know, you requested an exemption based on your previous plan design. Now you're tweaking it and they may just say, hey, if you tweak it, then you just need to go totally unlimited for everything, which would be um, mental health, uh, all the other things that go with that. So we'd be happy to revisit that, ask about the 40. I don't know if we can, I guess we could try to get opinion, maybe from a legal source to, you know, give us some advice whether we might lose that exemption if we tried to make a, some type of modification. Uh, I know Blue Cross is probably not gonna give us any help there. We'd have to go to an outside source and we'd be happy to do that if that's what the trust elects. Does anyone have any questions? Any um, suggestions? Yes, Mark. Mark. 
I believe you addressed this when we met in person at the school board last, but just refresh my memory, does the state have a 35 visit limit or do they offer unlimited on their plan? The state plan uh, offers unlimited. So they would have judged. That is, uh, is we tend to use the state as a benchmark for, I know on average we're supposed to be better than them, but I just wanted to, to see. I may have gotten lost in the numbers a little bit, Chris, in your handout. Um, if we went to unlimited, was there a figure listed there that projected the potential overall cost to the trust? No, that would be a per occurrence. So right okay. now, you know, it looks like from what we can determine, now it's a guesstimate, the maximum exposure to the plan for a year would be about uh, 16,800, and it could go as high as 120,000 per occurrence. And typically what we have found is when uh, a plan's provision is more liberal, then of course that increases utilization. Okay, thank you. Ed? Yeah, I have a question. Just clarification. Uh, it, it says in your document here that there's a request to amend this plan. I assume that's coming from a member who's currently probably paying out expenses for this. Um, have there been any other similar requests for this particular item in, say, recent years, or is this just sort of the first time this has ever come up? I'm going to defer that to Amy and Donna. I, I know that we, I don't know so much that's been ABA, but there have been other requests, I believe, for different mental health parts of the plan. I was just curious about ABA specifically. Okay. I don't recall ABA, but I'll let Donna and Amy. Uh, I know of, I know of three, Janine, that have contacted me. Another piece of data that we did receive was, uh, and, and they didn't break it out by ABA, but for 2019, and that would be for all uh, outpatient therapies for mental health, there were 16 people that exceeded the 35 visit limitation. And that, that would be for everything, which I would assume that predominantly would be for other therapies. There was only one uh, inpatient therapy that exceeded 30 days for all of 2019. So with, you know, your membership size and so forth, uh, and that was based on uh, about, I think about 750 occurrences. So 16 out of 750. And generally what I know when I worked closer in benefits, I generally, once an employee knew what the plan or their physician knew that the plan would cover 30 days for many centers, and then that is what was needed was 30 days. Um, there, that, that you, you see that very often. Um, Chris, I'm trying to remember at the, the last presentation, did we have an estimate if we were to go unlimited for our mental health about how much uh, in any therapy, how much we would expect that to cost the plan? I know it's a, it's a, it's a very big price. Well, that's what's, ver that's why we're, you know, saying it's a guesstimate because you can take a look at that right there and see if one person had the therapy and, uh, you know, we, we do know there's a member that wants additional therapies, but one person could go from 16,800 to 120,000 if they took the four full 40 hour per week for 50 weeks. Um, so we went back to Blue Cross and we asked him and all they provided us was an actuarial book projection, which <clears throat> again, they're smarter than, than I am, but you know, they're saying 30,000 bucks. I mean, you would think that once somebody even is aware that your plan is going unlimited, their whole, whole therapy regimen is going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I have any other questions? 
Janine, this is Amy. Uh huh. If I could just say, um, and uh, Chris might want to comment on this. It seems to me like there are, and Blue Cross has a great uh, behavioral case management team that we are able to also forward an employee to them for additional assistance. Uh, it's, there is more help out there. And I'm not against the ABA therapy, goodness knows, but I, it, it is not our medical insurance plan alone that is available to help provide treatment to children. Um, the, like I said, behavioral case management uh, at Blue Cross has a lot of additional information, and I feel like uh, the information that Chris and Kim provided as well, that last page of all the, there are other resources out there. And so I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Amy, I think that's helpful. I hope it doesn't come across that I'm anti either because I'm not. I mean, when I work with those folks at church, I mean, it just, now I'm only spending an hour and a half loving on them just so the parents mm -hmm. have an hour and a half break versus, you know, they're dealing with it 24 seven. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, a difficult process, you know, when you're trying to maintain budgets and so forth. And uh, it kind of, where does it stop? You know, there'll be <clears throat> for future requests for expansion of coverage for various areas. Yes, Charlotte, did you have a question or comment? Well, my comment sort of goes along with Amy's um, in seeing what we're offering, you know, more and more at the clinic. Uh, we, we are hiring this licensed mental health person, and we did interview several people who had a nice background in play therapy and things geared to children. So it's just another added benefit at the clinic when we do get this person in the house. Um, this particular situation, I'm not sure that is there, but just something to keep in mind that we have more and more services we plan on offering um, to defray any of these costs. Thank you for that, Sharla. Do I have any other questions, comments? If not, I'm not seeing a motion, I'm not hearing a motion to amend our plan. And if that's the case, then the plan will continue on at the 35 maximum visits. And then um, the benefits office will be sharing this decision by the trust with the member who requested the appeal. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I know John has indicated he's got another meeting to go to, so he's going to be stepping out. Thank you for joining us, John. Have a good afternoon. Okay. Next item is the financial statement review. Marsha. Okay. So I think everyone should have received the financial statement. This is for the month of April, which is the latest data that we have. Um, so on the first page, of course, we show our assets and our liabilities and, and fund balance. So we have a to total assets in the plan of $23,261,032.57. Um, our fund balance is currently at $18,430,000. 976.05. Um, so if you scrolling on going on down, um, the second page, of course, is our just our bank reconciliation. Uh, the third page shows our uh, current participation broken out by schools, county, retiree, and COBRA. Um, and then going down to the page showing the medical uh, revenue and, and expenses. Uh, the expenses were down somewhat in April, which I know, um, I think that's probably expected uh, related to uh, the COVID-19 and uh, a lot of uh, medical facilities um, doing, you know, less uh, elective procedures and, and less visits. Um, so currently, as I stated on the first page, our fund balance is at, uh, related to the medical plan is at 18 million 126 121.68, which reflects based on average expenses, um, about a 3.34 months of reserve. Uh, and in comparison to a year ago, it, that's down slightly. Last year we were at 3.96, so about a half a month difference there. And that's primarily related to the fact that, um, you know, average expenses have gone up this uh, in the past year. Um, and then, 
going on down to the last page, we do show the breakdown there between um, the groups, school system, county, county roads, retiree, COBRA, um, on-site expenses there. Any questions for Marsha? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I moved. Okay, do I have a second? Second. second. I'm sorry, who, who did the second? Tim. Okay, thank you, Tim. No other questions, we'll go ahead and vote. Um, Marsha Demarest? Yes. Mark Banasek? Yes. Amanda Beck? Yes. Uh, Tommy is gone. Charlie Hall? Yes. Leslie Helmig? Yes. Donna Mahoney? Yes. Tim Swaw? Yes. Jeff Taylor? Yes. Kimberly Yarbrough? Yes. Kelly Jackson? Yes. Uh, John has departed. Uh, Ed Long? Yes. Michael Johnson? Yes. Mary Thomas? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, next item on the agenda would be the experience report. Chris? Okay. Does everybody have the, uh, the medical plan exhibit that's in the, uh, well ours is based is in the uh, legal size landscape. You have that. Um, the format is consistent with the previous exhibits and the enrollment at the top of the page, it's consistent, comparable over the entire uh, plan year. So there's no big uh, uh, changes there in enrollment. Um, in section A, uh, it's a budget to cost for April and year to date. and is comprised of the employer and employee contributions and the reinsurance premiums. So you can see the total there in the third column for April and then year to date in the sixth column there, directly uh, beside section A. Section E is all the cost components of the medical plan for April and year to date, which is the plan liabilities. And then section G at the bottom of the page is the loss ratio, which is based on section A uh, assets and uh, section E uh, liabilities. I think most of you will recall we started off real high. We started off the plan year at about 113% loss ratio and then it's ratcheted down and we've hovered um, just south of 102% for the last several months. So um, the plan has been stable here over the last uh, number of months. Does anybody have any questions about the, uh, the medical plan experience report for uh, April or year to date? Hey, Chris, I have a question. This is Tim. Hey, uh, I just, um, and maybe I'm just missing something. As far as Marsha just talking about our expenses was down in um, March because of the COVID. Can you speak on that, how this is not reflective of it being, it looks like we're running for county-wise pretty high. Well, this, this of course would be for April and uh, there's some lag. So these claims have, were incurred prior to April and then it reported in April. So I suspect that's probably what it is, Tim. I'd be happy to you know, have Blue Cross uh, try to run us some type of report and get it to you if you want us to with uh, you know, some type of lag report. I think that's probably what it is, Tim. Okay, I, I was just curious. I just wondered, I thought I was expecting to be a little bit lower. I was kind of shocked to see the county in April is 131%. And I guess that's probably, uh, yeah, I don't know whether there may be a shock claim in there, Tim. It could have driven it up. And we'll check, we'll check that, okay? And then if there's something unusual, 
Now we'll make sure we report back to the entire trust. Otherwise, we'll kind of just get back to you that there may be a shock claim in there. Okay. All right. That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, anybody else have anything? That's a good, good uh, point, Tim. If not, we'll rock, well, let's go to the, uh, the dental and you'll see what Tim's talking about. Now this is the dental plan, of course, is for the school system only. It's a voluntary plan. And if you've got that exhibit, all I'm gonna do, refer to is the April loss ratio uh, of what, what is it, 39? We're just at 40%. So there you go, all the dental offices were closed. So they're, you know, extremely low utilization um, for the dental plan which skews, of course, year to date. I think you're typically running around, oh, 85 to 88% loss ratio. Dental claims are all, you know, I don't know, it seems like they're filed a little quicker. Uh, but anyway, that, that's the dental, it's an anomaly. And uh, we'll uh, get back on that, I guess, when claims start flowing back in the offices. I guess people are going to the dentist now. Anybody have anything on the dental? Yeah, you know we'll see those claims double in the next two months. Everybody's gonna, the dentist office are gonna be working overtime. Okay, no other questions. Thank you, Chris, for both of those experience reports. Uh, the next item is the telehealth in network. Um, and as you did hear Charlotte talk about the fact that the on-site's doing telehealth, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is now offering these services permanent. So um, am, am I right, Chris, that do we need to vote on this? Or I know we, I'm trying to remember if we need to vote to change our plan or is this just continuing? I'm not aware that we have to, to vote to change the plan at this point. Okay, okay so. Uh, I think it still may be temporary, right? Or do they make it permanent for? for this, they're, they're now indicating it is permanent. So um, I do think, and I'm, 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 Kim, I see you shaking your head. Do you feel that we do need to go ahead and vote if we want to keep it permanent? It's permanent for all of their um, fully insured plans. And so then the next step is we've been offering it for our employees. I, I do feel that um, it's very beneficial. Um, and so that's what Blue Cross Blue Shield is indicating in this handout that um, they are embrace, embracing this shift and um, they're making all in-network telehealth services available permanently. So um, I, I do think this is something if we want to continue with this, if we want to add this onto our plan, I, I do believe we do need to vote on this at this time. Jane, Jane can I mention something here? You all know mm -hmm. I to be the bearer of bad news, but um, if well, we know that as long as the pandemic is active, that these things are included in the plan. Uh, and I know once uh, they, I guess the CDC uh, indicates that the pandemic is, is over, then the temporary prov provisions go away. I just wonder if we can if we could delay this, it might be good. Again, here's, here's the rationale. And, you know, we're all for any type of uh, convenience to the employee and so forth. But typically the way tel telehealth works is there's a negotiated cost with a provider. Uh, and let's just say it's a $40 copay and the employee makes that copay. Uh, the way that this new telehealth works is whatever the doctor's office normal charge is, that's what they're going to charge. So I don't know if it's going to cause increased utilization or not. Uh, you know, if I've got, I'm just going to give an example, I've got poison ivy and normally I would tough it out, use a little bleach or whatever, you know, but now all of a sudden I just want to call my doctor. I don't have to go anywhere. I just pick up the phone call and get a prescription. And I don't know if it's going to cause increased utilization, but I guess my, my point is if there's a way, if you all think it's prudent to delay that, maybe the next trust meeting and see if we can determine from Blue Cross if there is increased utilization due to expansion of this telehealth based on 
the way that you know the plans are versus versus the previous way that, you know typical telehealth when you pay for the service uh, just something I wanted to point out and of course I always defer to the trust's uh, wisdom hey Chris this is Tim again hey did we have the telehealth a while back and it was just basically we got away with it but it was not utilized I know this Circumstances have changed now. The utilization is probably higher. But it was, it was, yeah, and it was completely just phone. And I, I'm trying to remember because we we had to pay an extra fee for it to offer to our employees. And after we looked at that fee, we didn't have enough employees that took advantage of it. But what we can do is place this back on the agenda for next time, and in the meantime, ask Blue Cross Blue Shield to provide additional information since it is still being covered since we are under the pandemic um, situation. Does that sound good to the members if we get some more information about cost? Yes, Mark? This is Mark. I have a, another question. If we go to a broader utilization of telehealth, is the provider able to dictate when it's used and when it's not? If I want to go physically see my doctor, will any type of policy change like this prevent me from seeing the doctor and the doctor saying, no, I only offer telehealth? I think what it will be is if you find out some doctors may just be, I'm only doing telehealth. So there, there could be doctors that just completely move to just 100% telehealth, mm -hmm. but know that you would, if they would choose a doctor that, that would offer both. I'm curious, Charlotte, what are you guys, I know we're offering it now at the onsite. What are you seeing? What I'm seeing is that it, a lot of it is up to the provider because of their own comfort level, like you mentioned, Janine. And also something to think about is sometimes the provider may agree to the telehealth, but once you get on the visit, they realize they cannot help you for that issue unless they see you in person. So they may actually require the person to come in, which is a second visit. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So it's a reason the modifications are there now is because of the pandemic. But once those restrictions are lifted, you know, they, there could be a lot of changes there, good and bad. I think one of the things that'd be interesting if we could find out from Blue Cross Blue Shield, is it a different cost, telehealth versus an in-office in, in visit? Is there, is there a different cost? So maybe we could find that out if Blue Cross Blue Shield has information regarding usage. And they probably don't have a whole lot of information yet since this is relatively new. But um, I, I, and Charlotte, I know, how are our employees and their family members responding to the telehealth through the onsite? They are uh, quite honestly loving it. Um, it's, I've noticed it's one side or the other. They completely love it or they completely hate it. We've had some patients literally demand to come in. And then we've had some patients that say, I don't want to set foot in a medical facility because they think that they could get COVID-19 from us. Um, I do feel like if I were to give my 25 cents, um, it could definitely be a system that people take advantage of, um, but I also see where it could be a little bit manipulative, perhaps on the doctor's side, looking for fee, you know, fee arrangements and things like that. From what I've read, and you all correct me, I think some of you may have read the same thing, that at this point, Blue Cross has indicated that their virtual visits are the same reimbursement that, it, that a doctor would have if you were on site. Did anybody else read that? Charlotte did. Charlotte did. Yeah. I was saying, I, I have not. So I think that would be a good thing to get clarification on before we do move forward. But right now, employees do have the option to use telehealth. So does anybody else have any uh, anything specific they would like to have um, Kim or Chris get information from Blue Cross before we review this again at the next meeting? I don't see anything. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic. Uh, let's see, healthcare reform. And this is, in, I believe, um, as it applies to COBRA. Am I correct, Donna and Amy? I've, I've, I've asked them to, to uh, summarize this one. And, and this is one that we do need to make a decision. Blue Cross actually wanted me to make the decision last week. And I said, no, we've got a trust meeting coming up on Tuesday. We'll talk about it here. So we'll go ahead. Take the lead.
say that. Did you want me to speak to that, Janine? Yeah, if you want to take the lead, you or Donna. Okay, um, I can. Um, basically, we received communications from Blue Cross that, um, and I, I think you actually have a document there in front of you. Donna, can you, can someone? Yeah. Pull that up or? Yeah. Forget what it was titled. I have yeah, my notes here. Yes, it's it's titled. Uh, for, um, okay. Hey, hey, hey yeah. Amy. I'm gonna. Um, and Amy's, it says that there, there's a. Yes. Yes. We're having a really hard time hearing you. Your it sounds like your um. Your Wi-Fi must be must be slowing down your hotspot. So I I think I uh, can you go ahead and speak to it. I'm yes. going to take over. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so healthcare reform update communication from Blue Cross. So um, there are time frames on the health plan. When somebody can add a spouse if they get married, if they lose other coverage, when, you know, so much time they have that to do. They want to elect COBRA. They have 60 days to elect COBRA. So much time to pay their premiums. So what this handout or communication is from Blue Cross is the um, Department of Labor and the Treasury as part of the CARES Act has established that there should be extensions, uh, extended time frame to make those type of changes I just mentioned. And there's like about eight of them in that handout. Um, and what they are saying is that uh, because people may have had difficulty uh, uh, being eligible, but getting those things taken care of during the, co uh, the outbreak period, and they uh, are calling the outbreak period the time from March 1 of 2020 until 60 days after the end of the national emergency is announced or until a date that the um, DOL and Treasury may designate. But whatever that period becomes, it would be no longer than a year. And so, um, let me see, I have made a few notes about this. Uh, this extension rule requires the group health plan to ignore that outbreak period, however long it ends up being, but it would be no more than a year, uh, when applying the time frames to certain action. Like I mentioned, somebody wants, needs to elect COBRA, or somebody got married, needs to add their new spouse to the plan, had a baby, those kind of things. So, um, a lot of those, all of them that deal with COBRA, there's also some mention of uh, filing of claims, um, paying um, your COBRA payments, which those go directly to uh, Blue Cross, by the way. Um, also, the time period someone has to file a grievance, an adverse benefit um, review, those kind of things is what they want to extend people's time to handle in case the COVID outbreak has prevented them from doing so. Um, another thing was, and Janine may have said this in the very beginning of introducing this item, but we don't have to do this, but Blue Cross is making this change, extending this uh, time frame across the board, and what we have to decide is do we opt out of it or let ourselves go with the change that Blue Cross is, uh, well, actually, Blue Cross is implementing part of it, but it comes down from the Treasury and the Department of Labor. And Chris, Kim, or Amy may need to fill in my gaps there. Does anybody have any questions? So at, as as Donna summarized so well from these multiple pages, it's basically giving our, our employees, family members, an extended amount of time to handle their paperwork. 
Right. If we do opt into this um, example in the benefits office, if someone had a baby, normally they have to be in there within 30 days or if they got married within 30 days to turn in their paperwork, this would give them a, a grace period. This would extend that. It would also give a grace period for COBRA benefits. So there would be some changes for our benefits office and how they administer. And then obviously changes with Blue Cross Blue Shield since they do our COBRA benefits for our former employees or family members that are no longer eligible. Can I add two cents? Mm -hmm. Has it been a problem? Have you had a lot of people that have not met the time frames? I guess I'm, I'm going back to that same old thing to where like you know, when, when uh, we have open enrollment, if they give us 30 days, we take 29. If they give us two weeks, we take 13 days. So if it would make it easier for you all to maintain your current provisions and you don't feel like that it's caused, uh, I guess, a burden, a necessary burden, it might be something to consider maintaining. It will, uh, of course, add further exposure to the plan simply because if someone has more time to elect coverage, and they decide they didn't want to, and then all of a sudden they have an occurrence after that time, then they could come back and elect coverage. So just a couple of points to consider. One area that I, I would feel some compassion towards is the folks with the COBRA benefits in the sense of their, when their premiums are due. Um, for anyone who's experienced layoffs, you know, when they, that would be one area that I would I would feel a little bit differently about. Um, we've managed, although the building hasn't been open, I know Donna and Amy have worked with employees. We've worked remote and we've been, you know, have, have you guys seen any problems with folks getting in, getting their enrollment forms in within the 30 days since we've had? No, no. no. I was gonna, uh, I was gonna mention that beforehand, but then I thought, no, just stick, stick to the, the document here, but no, we don't have a lot of problem with that. And in this particular time, we've not had a pro. I have not, Amy may say something different, but people have contacted us like they normally do. We've added babies, we've added spouses, we've, uh, you know, whatever we needed to do, we, we've been doing it, so. Um, Janine, this is Amy. Uh, mm -hmm. I agree, that is correct. Um, we've been able to continue processing things timely. The other thing I did want to add is that um, if we have the occurrence where a member or a you know, former employee, whatever, that is on COBRA, if they have difficulty making their payment timely, maybe they miss a payment and then they contact Blue Cross wanting to make that payment late, um, Blue Cross does contact our office for that to ask for guidance. Is it okay to allow them to make that late payment and come back on the COBRA? We would have that flexibility as we always have in, in that part. Yes. So if any members would like to make a motion asking us to opt in to this um, extended deadlines during the outbreak period if you want to make a motion. If I don't hear a motion, I will let Blue Cross know that we're happy with where we are because we have an amazing benefits office. The county does and the school system does and we, we get things done. So anybody? Okay, I'm not seeing any request for a motion. So we will move on to the next item. Uh, which is the monthly claims, payment history, and large claims. So you all should have a couple of forms here. Um, you'll see the claim payments by month. Um, and we have that from May 2019 through April 2020. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea where we have been. And yes, you'll see April 2020. Now just the medical claims were 3.6 million with our prescriptions, we were at 4.9 million um, for April 2020. In May 2019, you'll see we were at 5.6 million. So it's not often that we actually go down, but we all know why we went down this year, this, that month. So there's no questions with that. That's an information item. Uh, the next one would be the um, big bill notification. And you'll see, um, got a couple here. 
There's three of them for this, then it's 0001, so that's the school system, large claims, and you'll see one of them uh, total charges over 388,000 with 100, over 110,000 being paid, another one 884,000 with as of right now 204,000 being paid, and then another big charge 127,000 with a total of 127,000 being paid. So we've got those going on. And any questions on that? If not, we'll go ahead and move to the next item, which is to schedule our next meeting. I would anticipate the next meeting will be in person. Um, I think this uh, option for the um, for uh, remote meetings, I think expires, maybe goes through the end of June. And then I don't know that the governor will be extending that. So we can plan in person and then if, if that um, executive order is extended, then we can move that to Zoom. I do think we it's important that we try and have another meeting in July. One, to go over some of the pharmacy recommendations, and then two, I know that we did receive our, uh, information yesterday from an employee who is requesting an appeal. So um, we didn't want to have that on the agenda today because um, we hadn't had time to do much research on that. But um, just looking at maybe just the week of July 13th, the week of July 20th. How about um, if we stick on Tuesdays, how about the 14th, which is a Tuesday? They're giving me a thumbs up. Do we like, do, is the one o'clock a good time? That's week of July 13th, this is Amanda Beck, um, uh -huh. is the virtual engage, if okay. that Thank affects you. anything. And the following week, the July 20th week is the 12, 15 hour professional learning path that um, okay. certified employees have to do. So if okay, that makes so a difference in your scheduling. If we went on the 14th, um, would you guys be more comfortable like doing it later in the afternoon? So then you would have time during the day if you were involved in Engage, if we did like a three o'clock start time, do you think that would work better? Okay, I'm seeing some, okay. I've got, a, I've got a meeting at four o'clock that day, so I'd have to leave at some point. Okay. They are not come at all. Okay, so we if we shoot for three, um, that should give you some time here, 2.30. 2.30 would be all right. Okay, okay. Why don't we shoot for uh, July 14th at 2.30, and um, if we can do it Zoom, we will do that. If we cannot, it'll be in person. So um, we'll let you know, but um, as of right now, I think it's probably gonna be in person. I don't know that they, if, if they'll extend it another month or not. But if they do, we'll definitely do it Zoom because I know that's a that's an easy opportunity for everyone. Well, again, I appreciate your time. I know having two presentations is, is not easy via Zoom, but um, both of those had been postponed from one of the, the first meeting that we, um, had right after the outbreak and we had it here in the lecture hall, we had pulled both of them off of, of that agenda. So I, I did wanna make sure that they had the opportunity to provide that information. So our two big items for next time will be um, information about the pharmacy, we'll get some more information about the telehealth and then the appeal. And um, I'm sure there'll be a few other things that will show up between now and then, okay? All right. Well, you guys have a great afternoon. And again, I appreciate your patience and your time. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Here. How are you? Good. How are you? Good.